Nine million people in the city, all of them accident prone. The broken banister, the burning nightdress, the crashing car. We dial three figures and take it for granted that wherever the point of the suffering, they will soon be there. Sooner or later, it'll be your turn or mine. We'll find ourselves in the hands of the ambulance man. And the way they handle us may mean the difference between a quick return to health and being crippled for life. The ambulance crew usually arrive at the scene of an accident as saviors, as heroes. People have been awaiting their arrival with desperate anxiety and hope. But do those waiting people realize who or what they are waiting for? Are they expecting able substitutes for doctors? Or are they expecting truck drivers glorified by a uniform? What kind of men are they who have deliberately chosen to make their daily task an endless round of other people's pain? What can they do? How much do they have to know? Just how thick-skinned do they have to be? They can never know just what form of agony they might be dealing with five minutes from now. Okay. RTA. Westbourne Park Road, West 2. What they do know for certain is that every call sends them heading for trouble. This is an accident substation in North Kensington, where they have two emergency crews standing by in the daytime and one at night. Bill Lilly and Ian Bulldog are setting out for an RTA, a road traffic accident. This, like all the emergencies recorded in this film, is authentic. There's nothing special either about the accident or the crew. Just two ambulance men out of 2,500 in the city answering a 999 call. In London, there are 1,500 such calls every day, an average of one a minute round the clock. With a, an accident or emergency of any kind, we don't know what, you know, what we're going to find until we get there. So obviously, we've just got to get there as quickly as possible. Well, we are exempt from the speed limits and uh, we're exempt from parking and stopping restrictions. Obviously, we might have to stop in the middle of the road or something like this. Bill Lilly drives to the limit of his skill. On the way, he'll go as fast as he can. But if he crashes, no one will sympathize. No one else will carry the can. I saw you know, a car on one side of the road and a motorcycle out from the left-hand side of the road and the chappy lying by the motorcycle and he'd obviously collided with the car. Exactly what happened, do you know? You approach sort of as calmly as possible and it gives the patient confidence because people who've seen the accident tend to be a little more emotional about it than you do. Hello. The cash there. Any pain anywhere else? Take it easy now. Any pain anywhere else? What about your legs? Your arms all right? I think with a motorbike, you immediately suspect perhaps head injuries, even though we might have a crash helmet on, or possibly leg, a tip and fib. But um, from where he was looking, I thought he might have done something to his legs. I could definitely see the laceration, and he was rather shocked. The leg's all right, Bill. Let's get this blanket away. Is that yours? Just, just sit still. What's your name? What's your name? Bill, I think we'll put a dressing on. Or oh, wait till we're in the ambulance, we'll dress it. Did anybody see the accident? You say he wasn't unconscious, wasn't locked out? Definitely <coughs> not. What happened? Did he hit his head or what? Is he... He's on. He's on. He's on. He's just lying here, nobody saw anything. Okay. Bill, can you get that end? Just to put it on. As an ambulance man, you're responsible for the patient's care from the moment that you're called. You're responsible for their well-being. In fact, I believe that their treatment begins from the moment that the ambulance arrives. Um, it's very important, I think, that you, you know, give them the best possible treatment. You, you try and diagnose what is, what you, know, you think is wrong with them, and then um, apply the treatment as you see fit. 
you don't just pick the patient up, bung them on a stretcher, trundle them into the back of the ambulance. What you're trying to do is give them the best possible treatment from the word go. That's it. Just before we move. Now all it's going to do is just clean up the area. You remember your name now? What is it? Hmm? Okay. Don't worry about your uh, don't worry about your cycle. We're getting the police along to take care. Alright. Just put this around. Stop bleeding. I've got your driving license. All right, we'll have a look at that. Bill, can you get the law down to attend to this, uh, this bike? Having sort of initially ensured that there are no fractures or obvious injuries which require sort of immediate treatment on the roadside before moving him, then you can go into the more intimate examination in the ambulance, for instance, you know, look under his vest, um, where he's complaining a little bit of pain, see if there's any bruising or maybe minor cuts or things. There? You can move your toes, yeah? Move, move your foot. That's it. Marvellous. Bend it. Wiggle your toes. Yeah, OK, lovely. Probably bruised you, sir, huh? That's it. Now we get your name. Relationship with your hospital casualty department, our local department, is, it's very good. Um, I think it depends on how well they know you as a crew. You, you develop a working relationship. You work with them closer than with anybody else. And when they get to know you as a recruit, they seem to respect your opinion. If you go in and say you think this patient's not very well, um, then they usually sort of jump to it for you. It's a little different when you move out of your patch, off your area. Like the good copper, the ambulance man gets to know his own patch. North Ken is one of the busiest, and it's got the most variety. You start from the south end of the manor, which is mainly very rich. You know, you've got your lords, ladies, MPs. Uh, eye society. Not much work there, but what it is, it's very high class clinic work and things like this. In this five mile square, John Oakton meets every kind of sickness and every form of violence to be found in modern urban life. As you run up, you get the bed sit land surrounding it with your people who live, come and go, mainly don't register with doctors, give us a lot of calls, you know, for illness, and they're very lonely people. A suicide rate quite high. One of the main things is the cut wrists. They generally need a lot of sympathy, a lot of reassuring, but and, and a little first aid, of course, but majority of them really want understanding more than anything. You get the um, very old buildings. Um, some are boarded up now, and you get the squatters in, and, you know, the young people who take the drugs, and this is a big problem in this particular area. Of course, they live in rough, so they, they're not very healthy. Uh, a lot of them just are winos, you know, they'll drink cheap ciders and very cheap wine. They get run down in health. Plus the fact they get uh, beaten about by other people. Teenagers take the mick out of them and things like this. The pubs around this area, Saturday night get quite lively. Quite a big part of our job is assaults, you know, the Irish, I like a drink on a Saturday night. They're a big part of our area. Uh, husband and wife, we get quite a lot of that. We had one the other week, actually, where the son came home, a little bit the worse for wear, demanding money off his parents. His parents wouldn't give it, so he boiled up the chip pan and threw it over his father. We've also got gypsies. It was a big encampment under the modern fly over, make a bit of a mess, but you know, they, they live happily there. But it does cause a little bit of trouble between the surrounding neighborhood. You get called there quite frequently for assaults and, and things like this. Sometimes the, the young drug addict that you may take in seven times, the same person seven times into hospital in a week. They sometimes will be very abusive to you. You take them in, the next morning they walk out, take the tablets again, they're back in. Sometimes if you let yourself go, you can get 
a little bit annoyed. But mm. now and again, you get them where they've taken a big overdose, and you know you pull them pull them through, and it it's worthwhile. From the headquarters of the London Ambulance Service at Waterloo, they control the movements of a thousand vehicles based at 78 stations and feeding 400 hospitals. It's probably the largest and certainly the most sophisticated control center in the world. 400 of the ambulances are fully equipped to non-emergency call. On the electronic map of Greater London, the exact state of readiness of every station and of every emergency vehicle can be seen at a glance. London Ambulance Service. Good evening. We have an ambulance, please. To yes. Piccadilly Circus. Piccadilly Circus. Uh huh. Junction with the Haymarket. West one. Roger, Shorty. Space out. Junction of the Haymarket. Uh huh. One mile collapsed. A mile collapsed. Uh huh. As the receiving officers take down the details of the 999 calls, slave writers make copies of the message on pads at the controller's desk. He needn't wait for the call to finish. Even as details are still coming in, the ambulance can be on its way. In every emergency ambulance, there's a control box. By simply pressing buttons, every driver transmits his availability to the illuminated panel at headquarters. His vehicle will be show red if he's engaged on an accident, flashing red if he's waiting at the hospital, flashing green if he's free and on the road, and green if he's free and waiting at the station. To direct the ambulances, the center has its own telephone lines to every station, and controls four radio channels to talk directly to the drivers on the road. Three channels are for routine use, and there's one in reserve for major emergencies. In Greater London, the average time for a vehicle to reach the scene of an accident is seven and a half minutes. Hello, Westminster. Got a call an accident for you. The collapse. Your time, 47, for Par Hotel. Up here in the North Riding of Yorkshire, there's not much chance of reaching the victim in seven and a half minutes. Often it's difficult enough to reach him at all. One thirtieth part of the population of London scattered over 2,000 square miles. Twelve ambulance stations must cover the entire area. The nearest hospital may be 30 miles away. In Britain's rural areas, the standard of emergency service varies from pretty good to utterly appalling. In some places, there's hardly a night service at all. By comparison, North Yorkshire is good. At Thirsk, the ambulance station has eight men who tackle the whole range of work from high-speed crashes on the A1 to regular hospital trips for outpatients and cleaning the station lavatories. But this station is not manned around the clock. Hey, boss. Everything all right? Hey, busy. Yeah, underground. Jumping. At night, they go home. When needed, the men on call get out of bed, go down to fetch the ambulance, and set off into the rugged country. Odd times I can remember back to put the patient on the tractor and trailer, say from some remote farm, down to the road to where we could get to it, you know, so. Because the ambulance couldn't make it, is it? Oh, no, you couldn't possibly get there. Mm -hmm. So. You use whatever there is, tractor, trailer, sledge. Up here, the work may not have the excitement, the fast-moving drama of the big city scene. But the ambulance man is very much involved. In these country communities, there's a fair chance that the man or woman in their hands for the long, anxious journey is going to be someone they know. When the crisis is over, they'll be meeting them again in the supermarket or the pub. They take great pride that whatever happens at work is never talked about outside. It could be embarrassing, they say. People are in pain, they're frightened or distressed. Quite often, for instance, they have to act the midwife and deliver babies. Les Gawthorpe and Peter Smith are collecting a heart case on doctor's orders from Low Paradise Farm on the edge of the moors. Hello. Can we come in? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, boy. Yeah. Yeah, boy. Yeah. Okay, sir. Just sit still. You'll be all right. You won't fall. 
Yeah, this depth is slippy, Pete, so just watch them. All right, so you'll be all right, just sit still. Often on these cross-country journeys, to keep the airways open and to stop the patient suffocating in his own vomit, the ambulance man may have to stand for the entire journey, holding the sick person struggling in his arms. Right, so we're going to put you on this little bed. All right, we'll lay you down, make it comfortable. Right, that's it. Right, so don't prop him up a little bit. That's right. We can leave Mrs. Robinson with you then, can we, Oma? Even on the best of days, this is bound to be a rough ride. They'll do their best to make the patient comfortable, to make farming conversation, to take his mind off the journey and they'll be ready with the oxygen bottle. Very bumpy down here, isn't it? Yeah. 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 Have you lived up here a long time? Maybe 20 years. 20 years? Oh. You know every bump then? Uh, you've been... Yeah. You've been farming for 20 years, have you up here? Helping. Helping, yeah. Yeah. Are you comfortable enough? Yeah. yeah. This, of course, is not like the sudden violence of a road accident. Many parts of Britain are dreadful places to have a car crash. The ambulance men there may be poorly equipped and only basically trained, unable to practice modern life-saving techniques on the spot. There may be no doctor available. The ambulance men may only really be able to shift the victim to hospital, and even when they get there, the casualty department may be small and inadequately staffed. Very few hospitals have fully equipped emergency units able to give first-class care 24 hours a day. Your chance of survival all depends upon which county you have the luck to crash in. But in cottage hospitals like this, ambulance men can really feel part of the medical service. They know the doctors and the hospital staff. They're at home in the hospital and welcome. We know all their sisters by name and we take patients direct to the bedside, which probably they don't in the bigger cities. Uh, we, we, uh, they, they don't talk direct to us. Quite often in the ward they want assistance with a patient, you know, to move one from one bed to the other or a lift up in bed with someone, that kind of thing happens. And I suppose we have a little more time than the city men have uh, to do these kind of things. Hello, Matron. Yeah. We're going straight into the ward. Yes. Oh. They can watch the progress of the people they take in and can feel some share of pride when eventually they have the pleasant job of taking them home again. Hello, dear. Is this the bed here? Yeah. Thank you. Hello. You sit up, sir. Just gently. <coughs> OK. We're going to lift you straight into bed now. Mm -hmm. OK. Yeah. Mm. OK, sir. Three o'clock in the afternoon, and at the Oval Ambulance Station in South London, which is man, night and day, the shift is changing. The off-going crew has to pre-wash any soiled stretchers and blankets before they're sent to the laundry. The oncoming one must check that the vehicle's fuel, water, tyre pressures, batteries and oil levels are all right, and that all of the 100 items of equipment carried in the fully fitted ambulance are ready for use. Stretchers, trolleys, maternity packs, first aid satchels, suction apparatus, rescue equipment, splints, cervical collars, burn sheets and safety helmets, and some of the items are very far from simple first aid. This is an Entinox cylinder. It's a mixture of nitrogen and oxygen, 50% of each. And we use the um, Entinox for a patient that is perhaps trapped, trapped in a car um, or on a building site where it may take some time to get them free. 
Um, it's a painkiller, so we can administer that on the scene. Mm. To see how much there is in it, you um, turn this tap on here, and that indicates there. I see, yes. This yes. is about half full. And then by pressing the valve, you can make sure that it's coming out okay. Stuff in there, yeah. Um, this is an aspirator, very good piece of equipment, quite a lifesaver. This works on batteries or on the mains. Um, when you've got a patient um, who's perhaps vomited, you have to clear the airway before you can put a, an airway in. And to run it off the battery, you make sure that it goes over the 10 mark there. Yeah, yeah. And that, that's OK. That will last off the battery for about 20 minutes. Only one applicant in four is accepted for the service. Ambulance men must do six weeks of basic training if they wish to qualify for emergency work. The course covers everything from the way to approach the scene of an accident, through fractures, circulation and breathing, to the disposal of dead bodies. And also, remember, watch your patient. If he, if he starts to shout or groan, then you're hurting him. Pain's a warning. That's the idea. Watch that look. At the end are exams and an assessment for suitability, including temperament and attitudes both to colleagues and to patients. It's nice to know what to do when something goes wrong. Uh, you come here and you learn how to do it and to do it properly without making any mistakes. What was your previous job? I was a taxi driver. I was a postman. I was a crane driver before, just a routine job. Just as people come in all shapes and sizes, so do ambulance men. They are ordinary people who've chosen to do this sometime harrowing job. Dr. Margaret Haig, senior medical advisor. They go out from the training school as new recruits without really knowing what kind of situations they're going to face, which is why they go out with a training supervisor for the first few months. Uh, it is, and um, several qualities are acquired. And um, several qualities develop, I think, during an ambulance man's life as he matures and as he sees things in a different way. I think, ideally, an ambulance man should have humility because he's going into a person's life or an accident situation at a time of intense crisis, an intense emotional disturbance, both to the patient and to relatives, to onlookers and to helpers. And yet he has to go in and take charge of this situation. He has to deal with other emergency services who may be involved, some of them with aims slightly different from his in the situation. And it is easy to go in and be big, brash and arrogant, say, I'm above all this blood, I don't notice it, I deal with it every day. Ideally, I don't think he should, but it can act as a protective mechanism for him. Don't try and get the complete assessment. Just say, for example, deformity. Every three years, Ambulance men on emergency work get a two weeks refresher course where formal teaching is kept to a minimum and group learning situations are used as much as possible. Taking the one on the left first of all, comments please. Well, the right hand shoulder of the picture looks as if it's slightly deformed. In what respect? It seems as if it's dropped. Yes, anything else? He's holding his, uh, he's holding his elbow. He's holding his elbow, so that's probably the injured side. Very severe bruising on the right-hand side of the picture, possible fracture and internal bleeding. Could be. But some doctors, emphasising that these men have to act on their own at the scenes of severe accidents under the most difficult conditions, think that this training is inadequate. They compare our six weeks with the two years they get in Denmark, which includes 80 lectures by surgeons and long spells of work in hospitals. What is your conclusion? It's a dislocated shoulder. And if you ever see the squareness of the shoulder, you could say straight away dislocation. In one vehicle in 15, it's not the men in the ambulance, it's the women. Women like Helen Palmer. They do exactly the same work as the men, and they get exactly the same pay. Both men and women complain they're classed with unskilled workers like park attendants and dustmen, but they work the kind of hours and they have to maintain standards of performance and behaviour that manual workers wouldn't tolerate for five minutes. Stand by one moment. 
This is their code of conduct. Crews will be available for duty promptly and at the correct time. They will be courteous in manner, approach each task with quiet efficiency, refrain from words or expressions likely to give offence. They will always present a neat and tidy appearance, and that's in spite of the blood and the dirt and the vermin. They will not smoke in service vehicles at any time. They will never drink during hours of duty. They will never accept tips. When driving, they will set a good example to all road users and comply with the highway code. Vehicles engaged in emergency cases can exceed the speed limit, providing it's safe to do so. They will finish their call regardless of whether their shift time is completed or not. And all this for less than 30 pounds a week. Emergency crews work as a team, driving by turns. This time, Helen's driving, Pam John is medical attendant. The patient was lying half on the road, half on the pavement. Her top of her femur had struck the um, curb, and I thought that it was fractured. So you don't move a patient at all until you've immobilised the fracture. You've hurt your hip, have you? Yeah, she's hurt the bottom Well, I thought initially that she'd been knocked down by the bus, but um, when I spoke to her, she told me that she was blown over by the force of the wind. Oh, oh, okay, all right, then. No. I think we use the scissors. Thomas's before? Yes. yes. Have you hurt oh, yourself girl, anywhere girl. else? Well, you see, I was ready there for blood injection. Uh, were you knocked out or anything? No, she wasn't knocked out. She wasn't, okay. In this case, we just supported the limb with a blanket and padding and used the orthopaedic stretcher. Because of the position she was in and the fact that it was raining, If we'd have tried to put dressings on in that position, we'd have probably caused her more pain than using that orthopaedic stretcher where we didn't have to move her that much. Can you take your seat out? Thank you. Just lay your head back, love. Just relax. That's it. Where far? No, as far as you can. There's a, a very low pillow there. We'll make you comfortable when we get you in the ambulance. Up here. My umbrella here. Yes, my love, it's okay. Can you try and ease it under? I think it's important to uh, know and get on well with your colleague because um, at times you, uh, you don't need to say much to each other to know exactly what you want. You've got to sort of tally in well. I gave her some Entinox in the ambulance, which is a mixture of nitrogen and oxygen. She took quite a bit of that. Nice deep breaths through your nose, that's it. You need quite a bit of this for it to yeah. ease it. That's it. Keep going. We chose St Thomas's Hospital because uh, Normally we go to the nearest casualty receiving hospital and uh, King's College Hospital was closed. We carry a, a hospital closure sheet of the hospitals in London closed. And therefore the nearest available casualty receiving hospital was St Thomas's. In some cases I'd say it's an advantage to be a woman. Um, in the cases of assaults, where people are a little bit violent, language is a bit off, and they realise that you're a young lady and correct themselves and usually apologise. Nine times out of ten, you do get the odd stroppy customer, whereupon we call upon the aid of the p police. On one occasion, we, we did in fact have a murder, and when we arrived, the attacker was still on scene. And the patient was still alive at that stage, had 23 stab wounds. And we put the patient in the ambulance and we thought, well, we can't wait for the police because this woman's going to die. So we took him as well. The, well, what turned out to be the murderer. And we took him to King's College Hospital and locked him in a cubicle and called for the police.
Until the turn of the century, it was the job of the police to pick up casualties from the streets of London. Not just the ones who had been knocked on the head by touts or toughs, but also the ones that dropped down from heart attacks or were run down by recklessly driven handsome cabs. And this is the piece of equipment they used to do the job. It's a sort of cross between a stretcher and a wheelbarrow, and it's called the Bishopsheim Hand Litter after a city financier who had 62 of them built at his own expense because there was virtually nothing else in London to pick up accident cases in. At the back of these things they keep a box in which they used to have various pieces of apparatus and there's still a list inside which tells you what they used to have in here. One leg splint with foot piece, one thigh splint with hole and slot at one end, one tin box of stores and for those that they didn't quite reach in time one canvas body cover. But in the 1890s, the Metropolitan Asylums Board went one better. A horse and cart of their very own, especially for taking infectious patients from their homes or workhouses to the fever hospitals. The first ambulance service in London. Solid coachwork, a stretcher on smooth running rollers, a copper hot water bottle, a bedpan, and a urine bottle, all to keep the patient comfy. By the middle twenties, the motor ambulance had arrived in the dignified shape of the Ducrot. Things had become a lot more comfortable and a lot faster. In many ways, the Ducrot was years ahead of its time. It even had a heating system run off the engine, and this at a time when most private motorists only had a heating system consisting of a warm rug and a hat with earmuffs. And ten years later, by the middle 1930s, we'd got the Talbot. This carried two beds as standards, and for the first time was a genuine dual-purpose vehicle. It was designed not only for illness cases, but for accidents and emergencies too. In fact, they had a roller on the front, which used to indicate when they were travelling on an accident case. This was the type of vehicle, in fact this very one, that went right through the Blitz. Now we have the Bedford but still it's built on a commercial chassis designed for the transport of goods. No manufacturer has yet been prepared to design and build a vehicle, especially for the transport of the sick and the injured. There isn't enough money. Perhaps the service has itself to blame for demanding a dual purpose vehicle. Take your time, dear. For only 10% of all ambulance work is dealing with emergencies. Nine out of ten journeys are milk runs, routine collection of sitting cases for treatment at hospitals. But even to do this job well, you need to be something special in the way of a human being. For many of these old and infirm people, a visit to hospital is the treat of the week, the only time, perhaps, they get out of the house. All right, dear, no steps, just along there on the left, would you? The driver is supposed to make the shortest round journey, but there's always the old soul who asks if she can be the last off. The driver offers courtesy and kindness, tries to raise a laugh, but these are lonely people. Some try to draw rather more than that from his helpful arm. Does that mean you won't have to stay all Just put this round with you. In case you try to get away, you never know. Well, just a laugh and a joke, you know. Yeah. Be helpful in, a, in the time, limited time you have to spend with them. Yeah. Uh, and. Um, well, we, we try to leave them laughing, and this is it. You know? Therapy starts as soon as you knock on the door. You know, they look forward to seeing you come. And, uh, you know, they're so happy and relieved at the fact that this is their only chance to get out, a lot of them, you know, they just don't sort of move very far at all. You won't tell you what you check on, especially the older ones. They'll make a comment to you, they, they have a spare room, do you know anybody who could come in and live with them? And uh, all the time they're really asking you, do you want uh, a room, and would you come and live with me? regards of to look after him personally from that point of view. When this starts, I try and edge my way out and say, well, um, I'll be round tomorrow, but get rid of the milkman early or something, so he'll be ready for us. <laughs> We're trained not to get involved with patients, but uh, when you've been bringing a patient into hospital for over a number of years, I'm afraid you do get involved, there's no question about it. If they don't feel well, sometimes you feel a little bit rough kind of thing, you know. There is quite a number of things that we do unofficially. We've got to stick by the book of rules, but I think the governors wouldn't mind the little things that we do, you know, anyway. We don't do anything out of the scope of the ambulance service. One day, 
I took her home and I, knew, I didn't know at the time she was short of money, you see. She lives in a, a council flat. And uh, the next time I saw her, she was in Ashford Hospital. And when I went in to see her, I asked what she was doing there, which I always do do, and uh, she told me that she'd tried to walk up to the post office to get her pension, and she collapsed. And uh, the police found her, and she was brought into Ashford Hospital. And from that day on, I said, right, and when I take you home, we'll get your pension. And this is what I do, actually. I don't go off my route, you see. It's on the way home. It's a matter of just a matter of stopping at the lights kind of thing. It only takes a few minutes, and that's all there is to that. You've got home help. Uh, they, they do deal with this kind of thing, you know, but, and uh, social workers, if you know, like to push it. But she's very independent, Mrs. Smythe. I'm afraid, isn't it? I look nice oh, carrying this. Well, I can't help it, Ted. I think I'm a fairy. I'm going to put all my bits and pieces in a paper carrier bag. Ted, see those gases are all right? Yes, I'll check them. Because it's a horrible smell. And don't forget these tablets. No, you're all right, dear. Do you want these, all these tablets then? Right, you are. Here we are then. Ah, oh, good. Thanks very much, Ted. Tablets? Milk. Yes, that's lovely. Thank you very much. All right now then, are you? Yeah, I'll be OK, Nate. You sure? Yeah, yeah, I'll be all right. You've got a very busy afternoon yes. this afternoon. OK. I'll see you next Thursday. Yeah, but all don't right. forget what they said at the hospital. Yeah. If you do feel queer, ring the hospital immediately. Yeah, all right? I will. Yes. I'll see you next I'll Thursday anyway. Okay, no. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. At that level, nobody would argue either about the worthiness of the job or the ambulance man's fitness to do it. He is, after all, merely being the friend in need, the able comforter. He's living up to the symbol of the service, the Good Samaritan. But in the days of the Good Samaritan, there was no such thing as a motorway pile-up or an air disaster. There was no such thing as a terrorist bomb going off in a supermarket. The Good Samaritan wouldn't really have been expected to give an infusion of blood or to get a stopped heart beating again. So perhaps the most controversial question hanging over the ambulance service today is just how much of a doctor does an ambulance man need to be? If it were your mother or your son lying broken or blasted on the roadside, just how far would you want the ambulance man to go? Having made sure that the airway is clear and there's no gubbins at the back of the throat, then take your laryngoscope in the left hand, and advance it slowly over the tongue until you can see the epiglottis clearly. One thing is certain, that something has to be done. In many areas of the country, the facilities for dealing with major accidents and emergencies are frighteningly inadequate. Turn it off. It's been estimated that one quarter of the 10,000 annual road deaths could be avoided by advanced on-the-spot first aid. In some parts of the country, groups of ambulance men, all volunteers, are now being given advanced training to save these lives. The patient is then joined up to the Rassasi bag and an inflation is given to make quite sure that the patient is oxygenated. This should be done before you start to... These men are being taught intubation, a system of getting air into the lungs. Four minutes is the critical time. After that, the brain could be damaged beyond repair. I asked Dr. Haig just how successful these techniques are likely to be. I would think that um, in the times that they feel they can do this, they will be successful in saving a life one time out of two, and that when we have adequate numbers trained in this way in the service, this will happen at least four times the 24 hours a day. That's a tremendously high number. Uh, and of course is... I'm not saying that these patients will be brought back to life for good. They may well suffer a relapse later, or that may, their patient's condition may just simply be improved enough for them to be taken to hospital alive. But this is not the ambulance man's baby as to what really happens after the patient is admitted to hospital. It is then the hospital staff's responsibility. What proportion of ambulance men 
are suitable for this kind of training. It is demanding quite a lot of them, after all. It does, because one must consider that many of them have not been in a classroom or have been asked to think in purely academic terms for a large number of years. Mm -hmm. And um, some of them are just not able to or don't wish to take the added responsibility combined with the rigours of the course. I personally feel that at least one in two members of the ambulance service, the men and women, would be able to and would like to come on the course. The first day I went home and I said, I don't know what I'm doing on this course, I shall I shan't get anywhere with it. Dr Haig explained exactly what uh, we had been asked to come up to do. And by lunchtime, we all felt that we should go home then. I think we're now we've found we can do this. We're quite capable, provided the medical profession thinks so. Um, they're talking about cardiac ambulances in part of the country, defibrillators and uh, ECGs and cardioscopes, which will assist. We're liable to get more occasions when we'll use this te these techniques than many doctors, particularly GPs, who are quite often on the scene of accidents, but uh, really waiting for us. You know, most of the time they're rather glad when we come along. The A1 in Yorkshire, where accidents are frequent and fearful, and the hospitals far away. Here a local GP has pioneered radio-linked flying squads led by local doctors on a day and night rotor, working with specially trained ambulance crews. The ambulance men have been doing this over the last three years, uh, training for emergency care. There are certain things that doctors can do over and above um, an ambulance man's abilities, and this is where it's a good thing to have a doctor in with the team. But there are ambulance men now who are trained to be more efficient, in fact, at this emergency care than uh, the majority of doctors. Do you see the time coming when the ambulance man will be able to carry this on his back from start to finish at some of these accidents? In many areas they are doing now. It's most interesting. Uh, they're professionals now. We've treated them as colleagues all along. This is the essence of our scheme. They're paramedicals. They're our medical colleagues. They could have asked for more pay through trade unions years ago. It was their right, but they decided correctly, I think, to improve their professional skills before asking for the extra pay. Don't worry, it's okay. Mm. What have you done? This is obviously the way things are going. Ambulance men are learning more skilled techniques. They're using more sophisticated equipment. And with that equipment and technique comes more power to save life, more power to save suffering. But if they have that power, if they're going to be recognized as vital parts of the medical profession, they must accept professional ethics. They must behave like professionals first, last, and all the time. And we like to think that a strike in the medical profession is quite unacceptable. Yet that's just what we've seen. In recent times, we have seen ambulance men going on strike. You tell me how you'll feel when you have a coronary and I come to look after you. Do you want a manual worker to be there, or do you want a professional ambulance man to be there? We're earning £26 a week. A doctor, in many cases, is earning up to £6,000 a week. A year. Yeah. Yeah. Where is the justification in that? I there is none. The we have thought long and hard about this, and uh, following the Miller report, which came in 1969, we have been promised this regrading and new pay structure and we have been uh, fobbed off year after year with different pay policies. I take home, without overtime, £20 a week. Do you live on £20 a week? You can't keep dogs on that money, let alone kids. Mm -hmm. We've just got to do something. Most stopped short of total strike. They couldn't bring themselves to leave the severely injured to suffer. But up here in Durham, they refused to attend any cases, however desperate. Well, after we had taken the decision, the following day, I personally felt it very deeply, you know, I felt deep down in my heart that this is, this is not quite right. But you see, we had taken this decision and we, we had to stick to it. I remember those five days, I had a terrible guilty feeling about strike and, you know, all, the, this, all sorts of things went through my mind about the people being injured, people being sick. There, there was one spinal case, a chap who had fallen from a roof. And he, he should never have been handled the way he was. He but he was because he, you weren't there. He wouldn't yeah. have been handled like that if we'd been there, believe oh, me. Exactly. So in fact, uh, I mean, your strike did cause this chap to, to suffer for the rest of his yes, life. But this, this volunteer lark, they, they need not have been volunteers brought into the ambulance depots because we had 18 
Depot superintendent, trained, experienced ambulance men could have manned the ambulances at that yes, time. But can you expect but, them to get you off your moral hook? I mean, this is what you're asking them to do. Edward Cook is London's chief ambulance officer. Over the country, only a tiny proportion of the ambulance men and women refused emergency work. But plainly, the frustrations went right through the service. The strike in London lasted one day, but for Cook, it was one day too long. Well, I must say that I never thought I'd see the day when that happened, but I don't think all the blame should be leveled at the ambulance men. I think it's largely the growing pains are of a service which is developing uh, from the concept of a manual job. The ambulance man has been graded as a local authority manual worker. He is now being taught techniques uh, uh, and life support uh, techniques that bear no resemblance to that sort of work. I don't think the problem is entirely a problem of money here. It's this sort of growing professionalism in conflict with the manual worker conditions under which he works that has led to a great deal of frustration. Okay. Now we're just going to pop you on the side, on here. Just want you to sit forward, put your arms across your chest. Now lay back a bit. Now just relax. No. Put your legs out straight. We have never in this country sat down and said, what sort of an ambulance service do we want? What do we want the men to be capable of? Up to ten years ago, we were content to have a man, if he could drive a light commercial vehicle and had a simple St. John certificate, that was good enough. Now we train him a little bit further, we, we've gone into more advanced training. But still, we haven't said what he should be. And I think the, uh, the answer to this, of course, is to, in my view at any rate, is to consider ambulance work as an extension of the function of the accident and emergency centre of the hospital. And one would hope someday that the professional level of work w would be under a consultant in the hospital. Uh, when a fire brigade goes to a fire, there is an officer to lead in the firefight. Now, the ambulance man is the first trained man at the scene. Consequently, the ambulance man feels a measure of independence that perhaps you wouldn't get in other areas. He's also, again, in a very vulnerable position emotionally, I think. He sees the family in the car with two surviving members. He sees the child hurt and the mother's distress. Uh, he sees the accident or the tragedy right at close quarters. In a violent age, the ambulance men and women will always be in the front line. Often they must bear the responsibilities alone. They must have the training and the equipment, and they must have the status and the money that go with them. But if people are given the abilities to use these life-saving tools, plainly they must never refuse to use them. Green Lane where? Dagenham. Dagenham. 